we have been talking about uh, thermodynamic uh, processes, uh, different uh, type of processes and then uh, importantly we have introduced uh, the first law of thermodynamics and uh, to uh, carry on the discussion further, let us uh, talk about uh, certain important thermodynamic processes which we would be needing uh, throughout the discussion of this uh, uh, study of thermodynamics. They are isobaric process, the word bar means uh, pressure. So, uh, ISO means same. So, when the system is kept at a constant pressure which means that delta P is equal to 0. So, delta uh, P is the change in P uh, and that is equal to 0 which means that P remains constant. Uh, similarly, we call it isochoric process which is uh, when the system is kept at a constant volume. So, again uh, delta V equal to 0. Uh, which means that the volume of the system does not change. As we have seen that this can be achieved by keeping the piston uh, of a container to be at the same position. Uh, then there are isothermal processes where the temperature is maintained so that uh, there is no change in temperature once again uh, delta T equal to 0. Uh, and also we have uh, talked about adiabatic process, this we have talked about earlier where no exchange of heat takes place between the system and the surrounding uh, which is given by uh, uh, this is given by delta Q equal to 0. Okay. So, uh, these are uh, the different uh, processes that would be interested in. Let us go to uh, some of the thermodynamic potentials that will be used in uh, both the studies of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Uh, we would talk about internal energy which is mostly uh, if you consider a gas it is a kinetic energy of the molecules of the gas and that is the internal energy. We will talk about Helmholtz free energy it is often written by F but it is also written by um, uh, this symbol A uh, in literature. Okay. So, it is mostly written by F and so we will uh, carry on with this notation. So, F is U minus T S where U is the internal energy, T is the temperature in absolute scale and S is the entropy. We will see entropy in just a while with uh, uh, illustration and what it means in the context of second law of thermodynamics. We also talk about um, thermodynamic uh, enthalpy which is nothing but U plus P V is the internal energy plus the pressure into volume. Uh, we also often talk about uh, Gibbs free energy for example, in um, a superconductor we often talk about this uh, Gibbs free energy which is U plus P V minus T S which means it is H minus T S where um, H is nothing but the enthalpy and we will also talk about the grand potential which is U minus T S minus mu n. Um, this mu is called as a chemical potential and uh, will be discussed uh, later. So, this is nothing but F minus mu n where F is the Helmholtz free energy. So, these are some of the thermodynamic potentials that will be um, concerned with throughout the course and um, uh, mostly you will see that uh, we will talk about Helmholtz free energy um, and calculate various uh, physical quantities such as specific heat. Um, compressibility etcetera from uh, these Helmholtz from the knowledge of the Helmholtz free energy for a given system. So, uh, we uh, also would talk about uh, intensive and extensive parameters and uh, these thermodynamic uh, systems or thermodynamic um, quantities uh, rather uh, the study of thermodynamics really are they are divided in two categories intensive parameters and um, extensive parameters. The intensive parameters are uh, which are independent of the size of the system and uh, the extensive parameters are proportional to the size of the system which means that if we double the system that is double its volume and number of particles uh, then the intensive uh, parameters they remain unchanged uh, and the extensive parameters rather they double their values as we double uh, the volume and, and the number of particles. So, what are the examples of these intensive parameters? Uh, like pressure, temperature they do not depend upon uh, the size of the system or the volume of the system or the number of particles. Extensive parameters are many uh, for example, internal energy. So, as you 
change the dimension of the system uh, the internal energy increases s the entropy uh, as i said that we'll be seeing it uh, uh, in a while the specific heat uh, rather there is a heat capacity and there is a specific heat which um, is uh, really uh, divided by the cv divided by the number of uh, maybe particles so uh, uh, when we scale that with the number of particles then it becomes an intensive parameter and uh, volume and magnetic moment and so on and so forth these are examples of extensive parameters. So, uh, before we get on uh, with the discussion of the second law, uh, let us try to uh, see a logical uh, sort of uh, flow of events and uh, why it is important is that if uh, I tell you about first law and second law that is there in all books and uh, uh, all texts that are available on uh, thermodynamics. But there must be a logical way uh, in coming from the 0th law to the first law to the second law and so on. So, uh, just to remind you that the 0th law is about um, thermal equilibrium. So, if uh, there are a number of uh, systems which are in uh, connected to each other, they would all be in thermal equilibrium with one another that sets a temperature scale as well as um, it sort of uh, the thermal equilibrium is being talked about. And then first law is nothing but the conservation of energy, we have seen that and we have seen that how the internal energy a part of it is, uh, is the heat that is given to the system and the work done uh, by the system. And uh, we will see that uh, in more details when we uh, talk about the, the mathematical formalism of the first law. Now, uh, a lot of uh, systems would actually conform to the conservation of energy, but that does not mean that they would take place. So, this uh, what is written here that we know from experience that many processes uh, even if they satisfy the law of conservation of energy, they cannot take place or they do not take place. For example, uh, the water left to itself uh, it will never flow uphill. And um, if there are two bodies which are made uh, to come in contact with each other which uh, these two bodies are at different temperatures, then um, if you leave them alone then heat would never flow from the colder body to the hotter body, it is always the reverse. So, uh, but they do not in any way uh, these processes that we have said that which cannot happen. Uh, they also do not violate the first law of thermodynamics, but uh, we know that they do not uh, occur. So, there must be something else that prohibits them uh, from occurring and this is uh, embodied in the second law of thermodynamics, which uh, is expressed in two basic forms. In fact, we will uh, tell them in uh, more details and one form states that a quantity of heat extracted from a system cannot be converted entirely into work. So, uh, the heat that you uh, extract uh, does not uh, completely get converted into work. So, you cannot get the work done uh, which is exactly equal to the heat that is given uh, while leaving everything else unchanged. And this is known as the Kelvin statement, we will uh, we'll come back in the next slide as well. Uh, where we formally uh, state these statements that are given by Kelvin and Clausius and so on. Um, another version of the second law states which mean the same thing that heat cannot be transferred from a colder body to hotter body while leaving everything else unchanged and this is exactly which was there. Uh, so, heat never falls uh, flows from the colder body to the hotter body uh, and this exactly says the same thing once again that leaving everything else unchanged. This looks very um, obvious, looks trivial, but uh, stating them at a time when physics was uh, much less developed uh, was an important step. Uh, and this uh, is called as a Clausius statement uh, of the second law. So, these are uh, similar statements, but are stated differently by different people. And uh, let us see these uh, formally uh, how these statements are, but before that uh, let me uh, define this word entropy quite um, a priori, but it is important to have this notion because entropy is 
the quantity that will govern that which processes even though they are uh, they conform with the first law of thermodynamics, but actually take place. So, the second law actually talks about the feasibility of processes based on entropy. So, uh, there exists a function of state which we said that is same as the state function, it is called entropy S and uh, we, uh, we write it with S and it is an extensive variable as said earlier. Uh, it has the following property. So, during an adiabatic process, adiabatic process means that we have uh, delta Q equal to 0 or let, let me write it as dQ equal to 0 or even delta Q equal to 0. Uh, from an equilibrium state alpha to another equilibrium state beta, then the entropy does not decrease, which means that this uh, Q in going from alpha to beta equal to 0, there is no heat exchange and uh, at the most there could be uh, equality between the two that is S corresponding to the state beta can be equal to S corresponding to the state alpha, S means the entropy and that, that happens for a reversible process and in general for irreversible processes this is the greater than sign exists which means the system left to itself will never have an entropy lowered. So, here we come to those uh, formal statements that are made by uh, various people and um, they are the classical statement says that no cyclic process exists, cyclic means in a closed loop uh, which has its sole effect of transferring a heat from a colder body to a hotter body, this is exactly what we have said, seen earlier. Kelvin uh, made two statements. Uh, one of them says that no cyclic process exists which produces no effect other than extraction of heat from a body and its conversion into an equivalent amount of work. So, we are almost putting it in verbatim what they have said is that uh, you cannot have uh, extraction of heat uh, from a body and then convert it into work and uh, this entire heat cannot be converted into work. The second statement of Kelvin said that it is impossible to convert heat completely into work, they exactly are same stated slightly differently. Kelvin's third statement which is also known as uh, Carathéodory's statement, it says that different states of a system differing infinitesimally from a particular state and uh, these states different states are unattainable which means that you cannot get it from that particular state by any quasi static adiabatic process. Okay. So, if they are uh, infinitesimally differing from a given state, so this particular state, so these, uh, these different states are unattainable from that particular state, this particular state that we just talked about in the uh, line above uh, by any quasi static adiabatic process. Uh, this looks uh, verbose which means that there are a lot of words being put, but it's, it means something very simple as we have seen that uh, there are uh, the one is that uh, there will be no extraction of complete extraction of heat into work or conversion into work and the other states that um, you uh, cannot have heat flowing from a colder body to the hotter body. So, uh, let us analyze these statements I mean uh, for in our language in the language of common man and um, uh, these statements should be of course, equivalent because uh, if you are talking about the same thing uh, putting it differently does not make them different. Uh, so, they are same. They uh, emphasize the role of entropy which is hidden and uh, in defining the sequence of events means that uh, which process is likely to occur and which process is completely prohibited. Okay. So, entropy is a defining parameter or rather the thermodynamic quantity that decides that uh, whether a particular thermodynamic process will take place. So, if uh, no external agent is doing any work on the system, then the changes in the system can either be irreversible or reversible. Okay. So, the reversible process is accompanied by no change in entropy delta S is equal to 0 
and uh, the irreversible process is uh, accompanied by a change in a definite change in entropy and uh, a priori this change will always be positive, this change will never be negative. Let us try to uh, see an example. So, consider a red hot metallic ball very hot, extremely hot, it is immersed into a bucket of cold water. So, uh, if you wait for a while, you will see that uh, the bucket of warm water is in front of you and a warm cannonball, you probably can touch the cannonball uh, and also you can touch the water. But uh, before when before immersing it into the bucket of water that is immersing the uh, ball into the bucket of water, it was extremely hot. So, uh, you cannot touch it. Now, after you put it inside the pool of water, bucket of water, it can uh, it both became warm. Now, can it happen that if you start with a bucket of warm water and a warm cannon ball, we uh, get a red hot metallic ball and uh, so cannon means a metallic ball. So, this is what we have been talking about and uh, get a red hot metallic ball and a bucket of cold water that would never happen, right. There is no agency that uh, can convert a warm ball and warm water to a red hot ball and a cold water, okay. So, one uh, process is allowed and the reverse process is not allowed and the reverse process is not allowed because the reverse process talks about a lowering of entropy and which is not allowed in a system, okay. So, entropy has to increase. So, it is always uh, accompanied by and it is an irreversible process as, as we just saw, it is uh, always accompanied by an increasing entropy. We will do more uh, examples and problems regarding uh, this. So, uh, finally, what happens is that second law is a universal law of uh, increasing entropy. So, we will uh, do mathematical formulation of first and second laws, okay. But uh, before we do that, uh, let us discuss something uh, very important and it is often been uh, debated in books of thermodynamics uh, that what is the real uh, sign convention that one should use for the work done because you have seen that the first law concerns with work done, okay. Uh, so, we write dW equal to minus PdV, this minus sign is the source of all the debate and whether there is a minus sign or not, let us see that. Uh, so, very strictly we have uh, talked about that uh, this dW is actually not a state function. So, if it is not a state function, it is written with uh, uh, not with a d, but with a delta, but we will ignore that uh, at this moment. Uh, when you know that which is a state function and which is not a state function, for example, the internal energy is a state function. Okay. Uh, and once again just to remind you that what is meant by a state function is that, that uh, when a system goes from one state to another state, uh, how it goes from one state to another, uh, the change in the internal energy is independent of that. It just depends upon u beta minus u alpha. Okay. And, but the work done really depends on the path that is followed which is given uh, by an example earlier. So, uh, how is this uh, the work done? I mean, uh, is it the same work done that we are uh, familiar in mechanics? It is the same work done. I mean, in the sense that P is the only force, it is not really force, that is why it is written within a quote. And uh, this is a uh, pressure is force by area. Uh, so, this force by area into volume, you see that uh, this has the dimension of work. So, it is uh, force by area and dV is area into length and so this area would cancel and you have force into length and you know that work done is nothing but force into length or displacement so to say. So, um, if the system expands that is you take the piston out so that there is more volume, so dV is positive work is said to be done on the system by the surroundings, okay. And uh, when the system contracts, dV is negative, work is said to be done by the system, okay. So, it is on the system and by the system, okay. That is the, this gives rise to the minus sign in the work done, 
dv is positive. So, minus sign in dw and this will give a plus sign in dw. Okay. So, uh, that is why conventionally there is a negative sign that is put in front of the work done. In fact, in defining the sign convention that just being talked about, the frame of reference is fixed at the surroundings. So, you are looking at the system from outside okay? and that is why the work done is defined like that. If you actually look at it from the systems reference frame itself, then the work done should be written with a positive sign. And, uh, in fact, uh, if you see some chemistry books, they actually use a positive sign and uh, possibly that the reason uh, being that the, the change in the reference frame that is chemistry uses the reference frame to be the system itself while physics uh, uses surroundings to look at the, the work done a and it that is why it comes with a negative sign. So, coming to the uh, this mathematical formulations, we have seen that it is a du equal to dq plus dw and as we said that we are uh, neglecting the differences between an exact differential and uh, which is not I mean a state function and not a state function. So, uh, using this uh, convention of sign, we have uh, dq minus pdv and the second law, it is in an irreversible process the change in entropy is the heat transferred uh, to the system and this was talked earlier that actually the entropy is nothing but the heat by this ratio of heat by temperature. Okay? And if you think that uh, the y is this, if you, you can write it that ds is equal to uh, lambda dq um, which was initially thought that there was no um, hint that the temperature would come in the denominator. So, one would write it as a lambda and then it is found that lambda can only be uh, equal to 1 over t and that is why the we arrive at the second law as uh, integral of ds equal to dq by t and you see that we have not put any limits here. So, uh, it is always defines the change in entropy. So, second law only talks about um, the change in entropy of a system which is nothing but uh, dq by t. So, if you combine both of them, the first law and the second law, one can write it is uh, uh, dq is replaced by tds here. So, du equal to tds minus pdv. Okay. So, this is the combined uh, form of first and second law and it is very useful in uh, solving problems, we will see that. So, there is also um, challenging the uh, second law and uh, this was uh, Maxwell actually challenged the second law and it is very important to understand you know uh, that all these um, uh, celebrated physicists, uh, they started worrying about things when it was at the nascent stage and they started contradicting each other by uh, coming up with thought experiments or even real experiments and trying to question the validity of, uh, of various things that were proposed earlier. So, Maxwell challenged the second law of thermodynamics and he had this in idea that consider a volume divided into two halves A and B. I just show uh, a part of that here. So, there are A and B and we have opened a gate here and uh, there is a uh, daemon that sits here. Okay? And the sole uh, work of the daemon is this. This daemon sitting at the interface who can open a valve, this valve that we have shown and let a more energetic gas molecule from the compartment A to compartment B. So, uh, this is a compartment A on the left and uh, a compartment B is on the right and this daemon what it does, it selects a more energetic molecule and uh, sends it from A to B. Okay? It is just a thought experiment and this thought experiment is trying to uh, say that if there is any flaw with the proposal of second law. Okay? So, um, as a consequence, the internal energy of A becomes less because it is losing energetic particle and B becomes more. Okay? So, this act of the demon would uh, cause that to happen. So, thus by letting each molecule fly out of A into B, 
would further cause this uh, the internal energy of B to be progressively greater than A. So, now it looks like that if that happens this uh, is going to be a realization of a perpetual machine of the second kind means the, uh, the machine that we have just talked about that converting um, the entire heat into work. So, this energetic molecules embodies heat and uh, it is been completely uh, converted into work by this mechanism and uh, that would violate the second law of thermodynamics obviously it does. But uh, someone called Zillard uh, he suggested that there is no real violation of the second law you have forgotten something. What you have forgotten is that the demon is of course opening the valve and letting the molecule uh, fly from A to B it does work and spend some internal energy. Okay. Uh, so, uh, this has to be taken into account with the system because the demon is interacting with the system by uh, opening the valve and letting a molecule fly in uh, this becomes a composite power it is an integral part of the system and you cannot uh, ignore the presence of the demon. And if that happens uh, uh, the in terms of entropy we should uh, actually account for the entropy of the demon and then the total entropy uh, which rises and uh, that would uh, validate uh, the proposal or the statements of second law. So, the uh, this delta s is always greater than uh, 0 in the irreversible process ok. This is called Maxwell's demon. Uh, let us uh, look at uh, the third law. The third law is also called as Nernst law. So, we have talked about if you see it here that uh, it is really the change in entropy that one talks about in uh, real experiments or real thermodynamic systems. So, uh, is there a way to define and there is an absolute value of entropy? or how do we actually uh, put a lower limit and uh, is there a temperature for that and so on that is the statement of this third law. So, the change in entropy uh, of a system during a particular thermodynamic process between two equilibrium states ok say alpha and beta uh, they are at the same temperature and but characterized by different values of another parameter x we are not specifying what parameter. So, this uh, would tend to 0 as the temperature approaches absolute 0. So, the, uh, the change in entropy would actually go to 0 as the temperature approaches uh, absolute 0. Let me uh, show you by a picture and uh, the picture is here see this. So, we are plotting um, entropy versus temperature in Kelvin and these are some other thermodynamic parameters x 1 and x 2 and uh, these two curves uh, they correspond to two different values of x 1 and x 2. And uh, you are uh, you are bringing the system like this and let us see that. So, the entropy of a system approaches a constant value as the temperature approaches 0 Kelvin. By now, it is fairly clear that entropy is a measure of disorder. So, entropy um, is uh, the more the disordered system is the more the entropy uh, of the system. So, at absolute 0 all the thermal uh, motions they cease to exist and are rendering an ordered state and suggests of a low value for entropy. So, at 0 Kelvin a system does not contain any heat okay, and thus all the constituent particles are at their lowest energies. This implies that the system is in a unique configuration and uh, in its ground state for which the third law states that the entropy vanishes. Uh, this was observed by uh, Nernst in 1906. This means that a 0 entropy state hints at a perfectly crystalline phase. Uh, and is truly an ideal scenario. An alternative version of the third law of thermodynamics uh, states that it is impossible for a process to bring the entropy of a given system to 0 via finite number of states. So, as you see here 
that uh, you are coming at values lower and lower of entropy, the entropy is in the y axis and uh, you are uh, bringing the system from uh, A to B and B to C, then C to D, D to E, E to F and uh, F to G and so on and so forth. So, as you see here as you come closer and closer to this region, uh, you have infinite number of such small small steps with the decreasing uh, step size and uh, this is what is being talked about that uh, uh, it is impossible for a process to bring the entropy for a given system to 0 uh, means it has uh, truly a 0 value via finite number of steps you need really infinite number of steps. So, another form of the statement can be framed as uh, for a system undergoing a, a reversible isothermal process the change in entropy approaches 0 as the associated temperature tends to 0. So, this is what we are uh, talking about this graphical uh, representation of the entropy is that as a function of the temperature uh, it will be uh, helpful in understanding the essence of the third law. So, let us uh, fall back on this diagram that we had just shown. Uh, the constant energy processes are the uh, horizontal lines that you see here the horizontal lines B C and D E and so on because um, uh, they are uh, at a 0 entropy that is change in entropy is 0. So, uh, corresponding to lowering of temperature by changing certain thermodynamic parameter x between x 1 and x 2. This uh, thermodynamic parameter can be anything other than of course, this entropy and temperature it could be pressure volume and so on uh, we are not specifying that. Uh, so, it will require infinite number of steps to achieve t equal to 0. So, as you come closer and closer to t equal to 0, uh, these uh, number of these steps will increase with decreasing step size. Uh, so, important applications of the third law uh, mainly include understanding of the behavior of system at very low temperature uh, and it yields support to the first two laws that is first law and second law laying down a uh, foundation strong foundation to the concept of entropy. Uh, the entropy being 0 at absolute 0 and a finite number of processes is uh, insufficient to achieve absolute 0. So, this line here the last two lines they sum it all about the entropy and the third law. Mm -hmm.